Good morning, everyone. We're right at 10 o'clock central on the nose, and I hope everybody had a great day yesterday in the sessions, a wonderful evening, a chance to refresh and reflect on the day and are ready to get going for today. So welcome, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. We are on day two of the CASA annual virtual conference this year. We hope to move back to an in-person, but this year we are virtual. So um, we're going to start the day off. We'll have two uh, sessions this morning and then the CASA AGM to wrap up the day. I'd like to start the day with a land acknowledgement. And um, with that acknowledgement, we acknowledge that our work spans many territories and treaty areas. We're grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are with us today, those who have gone before us and the youth who inspire us. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes, and we are thankful that we are able to create, collaborate, live, and work here. We support community efforts to sustain our relationship with Indigenous people based on respect, dignity, trust, and cooperation in the process of advancing truth and reconciliation. I'd like to move on to thank our conference sponsors. Our conference supporters are John Deere Canada and Safe Work Manitoba, and our conference helper is Syngenta. Thank you to those organizations for supporting CASA and the conference. Without their support, we could not do events like this. Your microphones and cameras have been disabled. If you do have questions, you can use the Q&A uh, button on the bottom of your screen. You can also put questions in the chat. We have moderators watching both those um, formats and we can share that information with the speakers and uh, make sure they answer any questions you may have. We also have simultaneous interpretation for the conference. In your meeting webinar controls, click the interpretation button. That's the little globe button at the bottom center of your screen and then select French for French interpretation of today's conference. All the presentations will be recorded and shared to registered delegates. And if you do require any information translated in any of the presentations that anybody has done today, if you do want those translated, please contact Megan Drexel here at the CASA office and she'll be happy to help you. So that is our housekeeping for this morning. I am going to start our first session off. And uh, so I'm just going to see if there's Robin and we're going to take a minute for there is Colleen. So Colleen and Robin are our first two speakers today. Um, just some information on those two folks. They are wonderful folks and they work very well with CASA. Robin's right here in our office. So, well, not in our office. I say she's in our room in our, uh, what is it, our regional office in Saskatoon. Let's start with Colleen. Colleen has been the data, data analyst at the Injury Prevention Centre for the past 18 years. Colleen is the Injury Prevention Centre's resource for internal and external guidance on injury surveillance, classification, and data-related issues. She is responsible for providing leadership in provincial injury surveillance initiatives at the IPC. Colleen is the National Coordinator for the Canadian Agriculture Injury Reporting, we call that CARE around here. Colleen works with the provincial care coordinators to obtain agricultural death data from provincial coroners and medical examiners offices. Colleen is responsible for data analysis and development of documents using the CARE data. Prior to coming to the IPC, she held various positions in the health information fields at various hospitals. Colleen's knowledge of patient-related data collection makes Colleen the ideal analyst as this knowledge allows for accurate data reporting. And then Robin, she, I, I, I say there's people in the world that wear superhero capes and Robin does for me quite often. So I appreciate having her here on the CASA team. So Robin, she grew up on a farm in South Central Saskatchewan. She's the oldest of four children and she developed a passion for farm safety and health at a young age. Joining Saskatchewan Safety Council's Power Pact program as a youth ambassador for farm and urban safety. Robin continued to pursue her passion for farming communities after university, joining the Regina Quipel Health Region as the Farm Safety Coordinator and eventually moving to Health Promotion Coordinator. After two relocations, CASA joined the Canadian Agricultural Safety Association in 2014 in a communications role. She's continued to work to improve the safety of health and farmers, farm families, farm workers, and farming 
communities through her work at CASA. And I'll just share, this is something that I don't think we'll put officially. Should I make it official here, Robin? Robin, we are changing and recognizing the hard work she does. And she's going to have a new title uh, going forward. And she is now our Director of Programs and Communications. So I think that just shows her hard work and dedication, not only to CASA, but farm safety. I don't think you'll find someone much more passionate about farm safety than Robin. So after that, she's probably blushing. And uh, we'll let the day get going with her presentation. Well, thanks, Andrea. I do feel very embarrassed, but thank you so much. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so Colleen and I are going to take team um, the, the Canadian Agriculture Injury Reporting um, Fatalities in Canada 1990 to 2020 together. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I will start and Colleen, please uh, jump in um, if I'm missing anything and uh, we'll go from there. So bear with me while I share my screen. Thanks everybody for your patience and thanks Colleen for your patience. I appreciate that very much. Um, so we're going to jump right into it. Um, and this is just very, very briefly about CASA, as you all know, um, the Canadian Agriculture Safety Association. We're a national not-for-profit. We work to promote farm safety um, through our partnerships and um, through awareness, education and research and more. And of course, that includes the Canadian Agriculture Injury Reporting. Um, there's our vision and mission, which is also available on our website. So what is CARE? So CARE um, was established in 1995 um, in response to the better um, the need for better information about fatal and hospitalized agriculture-related injuries in Canada. Uh, so CARE has changed a little bit over the years, um, and now it's specifically focused on fatal injuries, so deaths um, due to agriculture incidences. Um, I just would like to acknowledge that the latest CARE report uh, was uh, funded in part through the Canadian Agriculture Partnership, a federal, provincial, and territorial initiative. So um, CARE also has a vision and mission statement. And um, you know, CARE does strive to ensure that fatality data is collected, compiled, analyzed in a standard manner by all provinces. And that, that information is interpreted and communicated in ways that are helpful um, to those in the agricultural industry. Um, we do know that CARE data um, has been used in multiple publications. It's been used across the world um, to talk about agricultural fatalities and what's happening on farms. Um, I was privileged enough to present um, the new latest CARE data in at ISASH, an international conference in Florida this June. And it was very interesting to hear, um, you know, very highly respected folks in the industry in, in, in farm safety saying, you know, the Canadians have the gold standard in data um, and that is care. So that is a that is huge. That is really interesting and wonderful to hear that we are able to provide this information. Um, then it does make a difference. Um, so CARE's primary audience is individuals within the agriculture industry who need to make informed decisions about safety um, programs and policy. Um, the care reports represent one approach to making this data accessible to this audience. Um, so CARE through the Injury Prevention Center at the University of Alberta, and that's um, Colleen and um, her colleagues over there, her folks. I would like to give a little shout out to George Frost, who has been um, just incredible pulling together the look and feel um, and getting all of that done. Um, he's been great. Um, and of course, Kathy Belton over there as well. So. Um, just really amazing folks over at IPC doing some really great work. Um, so they work with provincial agencies such as the Office of, of the Coroner or Medical Examiner, the Departments of Vital Statistics, or, um, or even Farm Safety Association to collect lists of all potential agriculture-related fatalities within each province. Um, the provincial collaborators, who are also incredible folks that are doing this work and are putting lots of time and effort into getting this data for us, they are um, fantastic. And we are so lucky to have each and every one of those folks in each province, you know, willing to go out there and do that work. Um, they pull the data from the detailed case reports. Um, they enter it in a standard uh, data abstraction form, and then it gets sent over to IPC for verification, coding, and analysis. And this result is a series of verifiable reports on agriculture fatalities in Canada. So like I said, they are incredibly well done um, and we know they're verified. They're, they're just, it is a very solid standard of um, reporting. So this is the um, data abstraction form. Um, you can see here, it's just a clip 
of it. It's also available in the latest uh, care report. You can go and see it at the at the end, or if you have any questions, you can let us know. Um, so this is the page one, and then page two um, also includes things like the cause of injury. So not machinery or vehicle related, uh, cause of injury, machinery or vehicle related. So things like rollovers, runovers, type of machinery, the location of the fatal injury, the location of the death. So um, was it on site, en route in the hospital, uh, and then relationship to the farm owner operator. So was it the owner operator that has passed, spouse, a child, a visitor, relative, contractor, um, the method of discovery, and then the nature of the injury, but body part. And then we also do ask questions about alcohol involvement. So uh, CARE defined agriculture-related fatality as any unintentional um, injury resulting in fatality that occurs during activities related to the operation of a farm or ranch in Canada, um, or any unintentional injury resulting in a fatality that involves any hazard of a farm or ranch environment in Canada. Um, so that includes fatalities that occur, occur away from the agriculture work location um, if agriculture work is being done. So this is really, where we're talking is road say road deaths um, is, is kind of the is what we're getting at here um, and the population of the people that are counted um, are that have died in an agriculture related incident are all persons who work who live work or visit a Canadian farm or ranch as well as persons who are fatal injured in other locations once again that goes back to roads um, in as a result of agriculture related activity um, and all temporary foreign workers under the Seasonal Agricultural agriculture Worker Program from Citizenship and Immigration Canada. And, you know, of course, this, this includes children um, and youth and not, not just adults. So this is the first full report um, published this last year since 2012. Um, and we published this in March of 2023. So it is available on the CASA website. Um, I should also point out that we just made available um, the Ontario Care Report, and that is now uh, newly available within the last two weeks um, as well. So uh, we have some data up there. Um, I'm going to let Colleen um, hop into this one because mm -hmm. it gets into the stat part. <laughs> yeah. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, firstly, yes, I'd like to say what Robin has said and thank our collaborators, our provincial collaborators across Canada, who um, work with the medical examiner's offices and coroner's offices to obtain this data that we're reporting. So thank you, everybody. Um, let's talk about farm populations. Um, as you can see, over the last many, many years, our farm populations have decreased. In fact, they've decreased by 50% over the years. Um, we're now, we started out at a population of over a million people. And as you can see, we are under, under 600,000. We're rolling at 557,000. So the farm, as we know it in Canada and farming in terms of uh, people farming has been changing over the years. Oops, uh, next slide, please. Okay, yeah, from here we are, we had, what do we got here? Oh, this is between 2011 and 2020. We had, there were, sorry, 624 agriculture-related fatalities. Um, so this is 624 people that were injured due to performing agriculture-related activities, or it was involved something with regards to the work farm environment. So. At 624 deaths, if you would please. That's 62 deaths a year. Here's how it looks at over the years. As you can see, we are improving. The number of fatalities in 2019 was 135, and now in 2020 we've dropped to 48. So we've we've reduced that uh, significantly. So, but there is still work to be done. Again, yeah. Now, when we look at the number, number is one indicator of how we're doing. But when we look at the number of agriculture fatalities and we look at our populations, our farm populations that we had seen in the couple of previous slides, 
When we look at that and we create what's called the rate, so our rate is the number of deaths over the population. So, and we calculate that for, and we age standardize and calculate that over the years. As you can see, we are experiencing, agriculture deaths are experiencing a statistically significant decrease of 1.4% annually. So that is good news, but there is still work to be done. And as you can see, when we look at agriculture related injuries by month, as expected, 63 or one in approximately one in three are occurring from the months of May to October, kind of as expected as those are the agriculturals or th those are the months to with which we see the most farming activity here in Canada. Now, of course, June through to September have the highest proportion of fatalities. And then, of course, we see December through March where they have the fewest because there's, there's very little, there's less uh, farming activity happening in the winter months. Now, when we look at uh, the mechanisms of injuries or the cause of injury by various seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter, we can basically, there are three main mechanisms of injury that we will see in all three of these seasons. One is machinery rollover, machinery runover, and entanglements are being caught. And then we also have pinned and struck by machine components. So as you can see by the purple, the machinery rollovers were first in terms of accounting for 15% in the spring, and 16%, 17%, and then again, no, machi no machinery or very little activity, I should say, in the winter months for machine machinery rollovers. And this would be caused by such things as um, too close to an edge. Those are often the cases, or an incline. And it's often the tractor that is um, the machine that is involved in the actual rollover. When we have machinery runovers, this is where an individual is run over by a piece of equipment. And this can include everything from unmanned tractors or cold starts to um, inadvertently running over children that are in the work environment. Um, then we have, we have caught entanglements and caught in machinery. There's lots of moving parts on farming machinery and lots of opportunity for either clothing and or the individual getting caught up in machinery. Um, and as you can see, that certainly happened, uh, was significant in the fall, where 13% of the deaths, um, there was an entanglement or caught piece in the machinery. And often things like combines and augers, that's where we're going to, uh, farmers going in to remove um, impact, things that are impacted in there and inadvertently get tangled or caught up in that practice. Um, yeah, these, and we'll go into some of these in a little more detail later on in the presentation. Now, as expected, 91% of the uh, fatalities are male and 9%, uh, nine, nine pardon me, are female. Now, when we look at the interesting piece is when we look at age and sex by various age groups, we see that a good chunk of the men, 60 plus, were men. So we had 289 fatalities of men 60 years of age and older. Then, of course, we have men again at 50, uh, 25 to 59. And then again, and as you can see in each of these age groups, males tend to have more deaths than females. Now here's where we look at numbers and rates. So if you look at the little dots at, in the middle, those are the number of fatalities. So as you can see for our children one to four, there were 26 of them. And if we skip way over to those that are 70 to 79, the blue bar shows us that there were 124. Now, as you can see, the blue bars indicate the number of fatalities. The highest was those that are 70 to 79 that, have, that had 124 deaths. But what we're looking at, what we're interested in, is we're interested in the little dots with the 
flags up in, on the top and the bottom. Those are our rates. Now, let's take a look at those that are 80 plus. You see that the blue bar only indicates that they had 57 deaths. But if you look at the little dot in the, up above, it's coming at 45.2. What that means is there's 45.2 deaths per 100,000 population. So even though those that were 80 years of age and older did not have the highest number, when we look at that in comparison to the population of those age groups, those 80 years of age and older had the higher rate. So does that make sense to everyone? Again, let's just recap. Those 70 to 79 had the highest number at 124. That's the blue bar. However, those that had 80 to 80 plus had the highest rate at 45.2. I think something else that's interesting in yeah. this um, slide Please. is that the children aged 1 to yes. 4 have a rate of 9.4 higher than any other age group under the age of 60. So that's pretty pretty sobering statistic. Exactly. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let's look at our young people. 26 deaths. And like you said, they are the second highest once we get over our older, older adults group. Yeah. Or they are the highest once we get beyond our older adults group. Now, when we look at um, agriculture injuries in accordance to the relationship, as expected, the majority, 58%, were the owner operator. Um, but surprisingly, we have hired workers and child of operator. Um, the hired worker could be anyone from a, a um, contractor that's on site to, let's say, for example, dig, dig ditches or they're building a barn. It could also include a hired, or pardon me, that's not hired worker, that's contractor. Hired worker, in, I'm sorry, involves those that come from the um, seasonal, uh, temporary foreign seasonal uh, program. I apologize. That's where they're from. Child of an operator is just that. A child that was inadvertently, uh, had inadvertently got killed while on the farm or involved in farming uh, activities. Robin, is there anything else you wanted to add, add to that? The other is always questioned, and that's usually um, a traffic related death. So drivers and sure. passengers who died in a, as a result of a motor vehicle um, in a collision with like a piece of farm equipment. Right, so that, right. That's, a, that's a bit of an interesting one as well. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Rob. And yes, the other is that motor vehicle piece. So they're not actually related to the farmer, but they this other individual was involved in a traffic collision with a piece of farming equipment. So thank you. Now, when we look at... Uh, defining was the death work-related or non-work-related. Again, 94% of the deaths, 581 of them, were work-related. So that meant that there was some form of work activity happening. 6% um, were not work-related, and those often involve more recreational-type activities, um, such as an ATV, driving around on an ATV, or maybe horseback riding, things like that. Those are activities involved with being on a farm, but they weren't work-related. Now, the second pie chart looks at the deceased. Was the deceased working at the time of the death? 86% they were working. So there were 531 deaths with which the individuals was working or performing work at the time of the incident. 84 of them were not working at the time of the incident. So, and again, this is often children. They were uh, drowning in a dugout, ATVs, horseback riding. So it was just something involved in um, the hazards of being on a farm environment. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when we were looking at the seasonal stuff, um, we have rollovers, runovers, pinderstruck, stuck, and then en entanglements. These are your big ones here. Um, and let me just, sorry, let me just scoot over there. Um, yeah, over a third of these fatalities are due to rollovers, runovers are being pinned and struck, and they total 238 fatalities. Um, 
the light blue ones are those that are involved in machine related and the dark blue are non-machine related. And, and these are just the top 10 mechanisms of injury. So there are other um, agriculture related fatalities um, it, yes. involving um, more mechanisms of injury that aren't represented on this graph. That's so correct. If anybody's, if anybody's doing really quick math and it doesn't yeah. add up, that's why. Right, that's right, that's right. There, it won't add up. As there were 142 agriculture fatalities involved in another 19 mechanisms. So we have 19 additional mechanisms to identify that were not included in this graph. So this is just kind of the snapshot of the big ones, the big ticket ones. Now, when we are looking at um, was the death machine related or non-machine related, as you can see, the majority of them are machine related. And this will include all forms of machinery, including vehicles, tractors, combines, augers, all sorts of things. And non-machinery is just that, individuals that have died that were not involved in um, a piece of machinery falling from uh, a silo or grain-related uh, asphyxiations, um, soil asphyxiations, drownings would be included in there. Um, let me just see here. And of course there were, yeah, and then um, in the non-machine you could also uh, exposure to tox, to pardon me, toxic substances. So if there had been um, manure pit uh, asphyxiation and things like that. Um, I think that answers that. Now, as expected, majority of the work is done by the tractor on the farm. The majority of the fatalities are with the tractor on the farm. There were 180 fatalities involving a tractor, which accounted for 44%. 40, for their 40, me, sorry, 40 motor vehicle deaths. So those are um, injuries or, pardon me, deaths involving motor vehicle that conclude, uh, that'll include a car hitting a piece of farm machinery. Then we have 33 off-road vehicle deaths. Those would include all of our ATV related deaths. Uh, we have some deaths involving bulldozers, skid steers, front end loaders, and then we have the farm wagon um, that individuals, bales of hay have fallen off the farm wagon and subsequently uh, resulted in a death. Yeah, when we look at our top three, mechanisms and we and we look at and we take their rates as you can see the dark purple line uh, which is the runovers it had a statistical decrease of 5.8 percent each year rollovers also saw a decrease of 6.8 percent each year however the pinned and struck was saw a slight increase of one percent each year um Now, when we look at when we look at our rollovers, we want to look at what is causing these rollovers. The of the ninety-one rollover deaths, there were ninety-one rollover deaths. Of them, eighty-one percent. Uh, sorry. So, of the ninety-one deaths, seventy-four of them had documentation with which we could clearly identify what was the cause. 36% uh, were as a result of the driver running close to, pardon me, driving too close to the edge of a slanted or uneven terrain. 23% were they were traveling on an incline and 10% were it was involved in a fatality where they were towing or extracting an object. Often the case it was trees, surprisingly. Um, there were 24 other fatalities in eight other categories that were not included in this. So again, this is just the high level, kind of what are the th main three causes of these rollovers? Now, when we look at rollovers, we're trying to, again, based on the documentation, was the directionality of the rollover identified? Did the rollover happen in a sideways, backwards, or unspecified direction? As you can see, it was either identified 
were identified as sideways and 43% were identified as unspecified. Whereas 11, or pardon me, 12% in 11 deaths had had, had a rollover um, identifying as being backwards. The fact that the vehicle, or pardon me, the machinery had rolled over backwards on them. And I, I'm just to point out that most yeah. of these rail rollover fatalities involve a tractor. Yes. And then next would be your off-road vehicles. That's right. 69% involved a tractor and 16% involved a off-road vehicle. Now, here's the one that I really like. This is the bystander one. This is the one that really identifies we are not doing a very good job when it comes to children. Um, and this is bystander runover. So this is basically somebody uh, that is basically a bystander to a, some sort of farming activity going on. And as you can see, children between the ages of one and four had the highest number and the highest rate of being run over. They had 12 deaths um, in this 10 year period with a rate of 4.3. Um, yeah, this one's ahead. really, sorry, I just want to say this one's really um, incredible to see. It's, it's extremely sobering um, to see that, especially little children, like under yes. four, you know, who can't tie their shoes you know, are the ones that are being killed um, yeah, and, by runovers. And, That's, it's, it's, a, it's incredibly sobering. Yeah, and uh, again, I can just add a little bit of antidotal because I've read the circumstances of these deaths. It's really quite sad. You'll have a, a parent and a child and um, the child is on the parent's knee and they somehow something happens and the child comes out of the tractor and gets run over or children are sitting in the scoop of a front end load or hit a rock and they bounce out and then they get subsequently run over. So it's really quite tragic that these children are, are dying because of runovers. Well, we didn't, oops, we didn't label that one very well, did we? Um, yeah, this is a game where we look at our runovers we have, a, there's a significant number of them, 31 or 35% are unmanned machines. What that means is, is that um, the, the the driver of, often the tractor, often the tractor, driver of the tractor will get off the tractor to investigate some sort of mechanical thing uh, with the machinery. And subsequently, then the machinery can, moves forward, subsequently rolling over the, or rolling over the farmer. Um, bystanders, we just kind of talked about some of the bystanders. This is just an operator where he fell and then got run over. We have passengers, again, these are with children often. Um, and then we have some that were just simply unspecified as to this, this individual's, um, where, if they, what their activity was when they were involved in this. Um, when we look at I'm just going to, oh, sorry. Whoops, oops, sorry, I've just got an extra thing there. Now we're going to look at what happens when we look at um, if when people are being pinned or struck by machine and non-machine injuries. The majority of them, of the 101, there were 101 deaths where an individual was struck by a piece of machinery or non-machinery. In most of the cases, they were being struck by a tree or a branch. Um, I found this to be uh, quite interesting. I found this particular type of activity more so in the East than I can say that we experience out here in the West. Um, the next activity was they were being struck by a heavy component. Uh, of a piece of machinery. But that piece of machinery, it differs from the hydraulics or lifts. That's when they've actually got, um, in some cases, a front end loader. It comes down and, and, and subsequently crushes the individual. 
Uh, Colleen, I have a quick yeah, question sorry. about the, yes, the tree absolutely. one. Is is that generally um you'll see with like maple maple stands and maple tree um, felling? Is that is that what you're seeing? No, based on again, and if there are people out there, and and again, I don't mean to. This is just an observation, an observational point. Is when I was reading them, I found that a lot of the tree related stuff was coming out of Quebec, and I was kind of and again, if there are callers on here from Quebec that can clarify for me i would appreciate it but i'm under the impression that they do a lot of free cutting um for how heat housing housing their homes so um a lot of that tree cutting I, I was in i felt the numbers were coming more so out of quebec and they were cutting trees anybody from quebec in the audience that can help me out with that no okay now, we've got a bunch of miscellaneous facts here for you. Um, again, one of the side of where it's not machine related is we have fall from heights. And as you can see, nine of them were as a result of falling from a ladder or scaffolding. There were seven deaths where they were fall this individual fell from a silo or grain bin. And then there were five additional deaths where somebody fell from a loft, an upper floor, or the rafters. Again, are animal-related? To my surprise, there were 32 animal-related deaths, but they were quite evenly divided, or close to evenly divided. 17 deaths involved a horse, and 15 in deaths involved cows or cattle. So again, um, managing, managing our livestock in a safe manner. Then we look at drownings by location. Oh, now I'm going to get kind of cut off. Let me just see here. Um, we have 12% of them occurred in a dugout. Now, most of those, the drownings, um, they involve, again, it's dugout, children, swimming, environment of being on a farm. Then we have another six fatalities where it was swamp, pond, or slough. And then we have four fatalities where it was a sewage, manure pit, or a lagoon. Oh, there we go. Or a lagoon. So, again, this can, um, these are just some of the drowning locations that we have. And there's more detail of these in the report. So what's next for CARE? So um, we will be releasing um, some chapters on some, some specific demographics. Um, they are, we just have to go through them and get them up, but children and women. Um, and you might've been noticing that Cass is, um, you've seen a couple little bit of uh, here and there um, through the conference of uh, some different looks. And um, so CARE will also be undergoing a rebrand. Um, and as a result of the, um, the stats with especially the little children. Um, we're going to be uh, launching a child safety week next year um, to really talk to caregivers about um, the dangers um, on the farm around children and hopefully get out that, that word and that information um, to those folks that we are still seeing far too many deaths um, due to um, agriculture related incidences on the farm. Um, and so I just wanna say thank you for all of your attention. Um, please feel free to reach out to uh, myself or Colleen. And I think um, we're, we do have some time for some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing, sharing my screen and I'm going to look at the chat. There we go. Uh, yeah, Dean said, uh, or the child is backed over. Yeah, that's stuff. That yes. Yeah. 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 Does anyone have any questions about the care stats or information? I'm, I'm wondering, Colleen, because you do see the data, if there's anything that stands out, like I know you've talked about some of the trends, but just where you're saying often, how children are injured. Um, just anything standing out there from, from what you looked at? Um, yeah, like kind of as I mentioned, and we I can certainly look at this. Uh, again, I kind of noticed that there were some regional differences. Um, again, I was noticing that in Quebec, they tend to have more tree fallen type activities. Um, in the prairies here, of course, we have more... Um, machinery in terms of tractors and combine type activity. 
um, in terms of children. Um, I, and again, um, there's a, because I have, because I have the ability or I have, I have the, I can read the detailed descriptions. In some cases we have, um, it's quite saddened to see, we'll have a child, let's say for example, uh, again, there's had drowning brain. Well, his brother went to look for him and subsequently lost two children. So, you know, I, there's just some stories that really kind of stick with me after having read them for many, many years. Um, but yeah, no, children, I think there's still some work that we can be doing with regards to children on the farm. Um, they're a special group. Um, and I'm, yeah, and I'll be happy to work with Robin and Casa on getting in you know, working with, to look at children and what's happening with them. So that's nice. Yeah. And so we, CASA is looking at starting next spring, uh, Child and Youth mm -hmm. Safety Week, nice. and uh, really focusing on that. We know that's a vulnerable uh, population on farm. The other population that quite often you see a lot of, you know, I always, I smile because we call it injury reporting and it's it's fatal injuries. And, and I think, you know, we're just trying to be nuanced with our language, but it's people dying on farm. And so the other ages are older, older men on farm who often are injured. Are you seeing any trends there that we can pick up? And I know this, uh, Angie's presentation touches on this a little bit as well, but in looking at what can we do as um, safety people to try and help that category? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, I think it would be best to go to your your audience and uh, see what they have to say. But yeah, no, there's definitely again some work like you said, kind of in our older spectrum, in our younger spectrum, there's certainly opportunities for us in terms of safety, safety messaging for them. When you dug into the data, were there any trends with like any, yeah, trends uh, with our older generation? And like, um, I, ha I, mean, I can't say that I found anything specific that really took me by surprise, shall we say. A lot, a lot of the older farmers, I, again, just kind of anecdotally off the top of my head, um, they were quite casual about the unmanned machinery run over. I think your older farmer is more likely to leave a piece of machinery running, fiddle with it uh, in terms of mechanically, and then inadvertently the machine lunges forward. And like I said, that I think is more, more so common with the, the older farmer than it is with the younger farmer. And I think that that leads into a little bit of what we know, and I think uh, Robin too could speak to this, is where it often, when we see injuries or fatalities on farm, it's, I just want to get it done. I just want to get it done quickly. I've done it a thousand times. Uh -huh. so, yeah. Uh -huh. um, Trevor made a comment in the chat that the infographic specific to, sure, you put a word in with lots of vowels. You know, I love those words. Asphyxiation, seniors and child and youth are great. And can they be updated? I don't think, Robin, we've identified what we want to update and focus on. Um, Colleen, have you guys chatted about that? Mm, not at this time, no. no. Once we get those reports um, uh, published, what we can do, especially with the children and women, is go through that and flag some things. I know um, George Frost, like I mentioned before, um, over at IPC, he's he's a fantastic graphic designer and really intuitive about this stuff. So we've talked about making some new... Um, uh, infographics and shareables um, that really are easy to understand for folks, oh. um, especially um, the report gets to be a bit overwhelming um, for the lay person or someone, maybe a farmer that just wants to pick it up or read it. Uh -huh. um, so something that's easy, easy to digest, something that's shareable on socials um, that folks can really um, understand and, and is impactful. So we'll definitely be looking at that and uh, moving that, that uh, needle forward. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have another question. Um, I just saw here, is there an opportunity for equipment manufacturers to make their vehicles less likely to roll over? Oh, very good. Uh, that one I can't, that's an engineering kind of thing. And that's beyond mine, beyond my purview. Bruce here. 
<laughs> from yeah. yesterday. Uh, Bruce is here. I just, I don't know. I think Bruce may be traveling. And uh, so I don't know if he can chime in in the chat or not. Cool. Um, I think that goes around your machine safety standards and all those, all those aspects of manufacturing and speaking with the manufacturers. Uh, Angie says, wear seatbelts and use ROPS on tractors. Yes, Angie is a great expert as well. And uh, yeah, oh. Bruce said their equipment standards for rollers, overs, and tip overs. So the standards exist um, and that people need to use them. But yes, if people aren't wearing a seatbelt, if people aren't using, and I see Angie and Bruce are available to, to pop in if they want. And I don't know if Angie, if you want to do a little bit around this or if we're wandering into your presentation, we probably have time for a break. So we probably don't want to dive too deep into Angie, but I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> here like we'll have a mini panel all of a sudden yeah. um, but just around that and I think it's use it's careful I don't know Angie if you have thoughts on that yeah you know and that's a really good so I saw that question and the first thing I thought of is you know it we're never going to be able to engineer something basically it, it needs to be in bubble wrap you know and, and so th that's never going to happen and so we need to use those tools that are available and that's buckling that seatbelt. And especially, you know, the conversation has really been around older tractor operators. And so my question is not, not for, you know, any of us to answer, but how many of those older operators are still operating on equipment from the 1960s that does not have rollover protection, protective structures, right? They don't have ROPS. And so when you don't have that, um, your chances of tipping over and getting crushed are going to be increased because you don't have that structure. So are we installing that protective structure? And then if we do, it also takes the next step is installing a seatbelt. They have to be hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And so I just think that's that's kind of the comment I wanted to share about, about that. Yeah. And, and we have seen, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rob. Um, and Colleen, we have seen a reduction of rollovers um, from mm -hmm. the statistics. And, you know, um, anecdotally, what I've heard, and I might be wrong, is that because of machinery, machines have gotten bigger, um, more stable, the engineering's gotten better and better all the time with tech, um, things are less likely to roll over. Um, so, you know, we're still seeing that. But of course, things like lifting your bucket too high and rolling over, tipping over backwards, right? That's always definitely a hazard. Um, you know, or like you said, um, traveling too close to the edge. Um, I was driving through um, Washington State and it's incredibly hilly and they're farming on these incredible hills. And I'm like, I, I said to my husband, I was like, it's incredible what tech has done um, to prevent, you know, these folks that are doing the, this work um, to be safe on these, inc the, these, these incredible inclines that they're farming on. I mean, I live in Saskatchewan very flat uh, so <laughs> there's not a lot of ro big giant rolling hills so it, it is pretty interesting and, and probably Bruce can even speak to that um better than I can Bruce yeah, right um, here <laughs> yeah I don't know if, if you can see or hear me here I just mm -hmm. gotcha. having some trouble with zoom so but yeah I mean there are standards for for rollover tip over and you know I'm not an expert on those but they would definitely take into account the foreseeable use of the machinery so if it's you know, being used in, in a way that is within the limits of the machine, it's, you're not going to see those rollover tip overs. I mean, it, they're going to account for that within the, the standards there. So, you know, normal use, it should be more like abnormal, you know, unintended use where you might start seeing those, those kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. So, and for those of you who are going, who are these people that popped on my screen? <laughs> uh, Andy Johnson, she's going to be doing our next presentation, and she is from the uh, North Dakota, I got a state university. I'm trying to get the acronyms real quick converted on my notes here. And she is an agricultural and natural resources extension agent. And she has a wonderful presentation coming up right after this one about some really interesting reporting around injuries. Um, and Bruce James, uh, Bruce is on our board. He's an agricultural engineer. He works for AGI. I don't know exactly what engineering with AGI you do, but he's just a fabulous, I'll say brain to have on the mm -hmm. board. Really, yeah. really thinks about these things and helps us uh, talk about that. 
One of the things that we're chatting about and we're trying to get our hands around at CASA is the right to repair legislation. And so this is coming through the Copyright Act um, in the, at the uh, national level in Parliament. And so I think it's going for its third reading. And so we're looking at saying, yeah, right to repair for farmers is huge, that they can be able to do that and not rely on external services to come in and repair their machines. But what are the risks as far as risk to the farmer doing the repair, risk to the repairs that may be done? Like, are they doing, are they following all the standards? Are they doing them right? And what might they figure out to turn off? Because I know, and I know, I'll, Robin, you talk about, uh, you know, someone who just wants to turn, is it, is it the seatbelt or the backup beeper? It's the seatbelt dinger <laughs> in, in the half ton. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting conversation in balancing safety and innovation and how we do that. I don't know. Any thoughts out there? We'll take maybe two minutes on and then see if there's any wrap ups. Maybe we won't be able to have time for a break. No thoughts? On yeah. Oh, if you're if you're looking for me to, to say something on it oh. specifically, um, yeah, like right, right to repair. It's I think it's good, like you know, allowing farmers, you know, to be able to get in there and 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 do that maintenance or service overhaul, you know, when they may not have access to, you know, get it repaired right away. But I mean, the the main thing I see is a concern from from the manufacturing side is, you know, making sure that they get the proper training um, on how to do that. I mean, you can't just go and overhaul a, a tractor or a combine without, you know, specialized training, you know, um, a lot of it, you know, heavy duty mechanics, you know, there's a lot of very specialized training and it's not something that we just want people, anybody to go do. So, you know, you need to have, make sure you have the crop, proper credentials. So I, it's kind of a, a, a risk with, with giving that access out is making sure that, that people are properly trained to do that work safely. So. I took us down a rabbit hole there. Any yeah. other final, like I pulled, we pulled Bruce and Angie in on this and I'm just looking at the chats real quick. Um, yeah, so uh, Neil said, yes, ROPS and seatbelts, though many older tractors still use, don't have ROPS, work work on going to look at cost-effective ways to properly retrofit and oh, yeah, no. lots of old tractors. So we went down a little bit of a, a tractor uh, engineering standard. Yeah. Uh, chief there but are there any final thoughts questions anything for for robin and colleen on the care data that was shared going back to where we started absolutely fantastic i mean that work that work you all are doing is just leaps and bounds ahead of of where we're at and where we're trying to go and so keep it up it makes it you're making a difference because we have to identify the problem in order to start with that prevention education and, and make a difference so thanks for everything that you guys are doing so we are about seven minutes to the top of the hour angie is going to come back at the top of the hour and join us why don't we just take five minutes people take a stretch um i know we we sit far too much but take a walk around the office and uh, join us back here in five minutes. And I'm, I really, when I saw Angie's presentation at ISASH, I was like, okay, she is on the agenda. So um, no pressure, Angie, but <laughs> it'll be great. And it's fabulous information. So see you back at, in about five minutes, folks. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I hope you got a chance to take that quick stroll, stretch, whatever you needed. Um, and not answered 20 emails in 30 seconds. But uh, it's uh, it's good to have you back. And I know myself, I, it was my first curling game last night. I love to curl. I've done it for many, many, many years. And uh, we were doing math last night. It's over 40 years that I have curled. And um, I, was, I was doing some stretching. I was like, okay, my legs, they weren't too excited about curling, but we did win. So that's what matters, right? So we're going to move into our final presentation. The AGM is after this presentation. And I think I have uh, set Angie up a little bit, but I'm going to share who Angie is a little bit more. So Angie has worked with the North Dakota State University Extension for nearly nine years, serving as an agricultural and natural resource extension agent in Steele County, North Dakota. 
for seven years. During her time as a county extension agent, she's earned her certified crop advisor accreditation, focusing her work on solving agronomic challenges her producers face, along with building a beef production program to help producers gain strength and confidence in managing their herds. When the COVID-19 pandemic struck, a crippling farm labor force shortage struck, causing NDSU Extension to develop a task force focusing on farm worker health and safety. Angie co-led this task force, which identified the underlying health needs for farm and ranch safety awareness, education, and training for farm families and workers in North Dakota. This led to a push for legislative funding to create a farm and ranch safety program back within NDSU Extension. Angie's passion for farm and ranch safety efforts continued beyond the COVID-19 task force, and she now serves as the new NDSU Extension Farm Ranch and Safety Coordinator. Does the new mean that you did it and now it's official? Um, if it is, fabulous. A position that has been absent since 2005. So great to see the state supporting that. Angie holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Animal Sciences from NDSU and is currently a graduate student at NDSU, studying agricultural-related injuries and fatalities in the Upper Midwest through the Extension Education Master's Program at NDSU. Angie is presenting on behalf of her research team of Hilla Sang, PhD Sanford Health, Elizabeth Gilblum, PhD NDSU School of Education, and Cheryl Sarr, MD Sanford Health. So Angie, so happy you could join us today and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for giving your time to us. Yes, thank you so much for that very, very kind introduction. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, just so everybody can take a peek at that. Could someone just let me know thumbs up or verbally that they see my screen? It's there. You're good. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, thank you for the very kind introduction, and it was awesome to be able to meet uh, many of you from Team CASA down at the ISASH convention uh, in Florida this past June. Uh, your work, like I said earlier before the presentation, I it, it's just it's phenomenal uh, where you're at, leaps and bounds ahead of us. And I'll, I'm open and honest to admit that in terms of where you're at with your surveillance work when it comes to ag agricultural related injuries and fatalities. Um, but we're getting there um, now that We've actually got a farm and ranch safety program through NDSU Extension. We we have the opportunity to do a better job looking at research, looking at surveillance methods, and trying to, quite frankly, understand what's happening in North Dakota and, and the upper Midwest when it comes to farm and ranch related incidences. And today I'll really be focusing and highlighting on tractor related incidences, um, simply because we gotta start somewhere. We gotta narrow down and, and look at where, where our data has taken us. And to no surprise to this group, uh, tractor related incidences are, are our biggest problem when, when we took a look at the data. And so uh, again, just highlighting my research team because this would not happen without um, our School of Education, my co-advisor, Dr. Elizabeth Gilbloom, as well as our colleagues at Samford Health, our largest healthcare facility uh, based in the upper Midwest, uh, looking at being able to have to look at that data to showcase what's going on in the world of agricultural related injuries. So as a reminder, our programs are open to everyone. And so if you have any questions, please don't ever hesitate to reach out to our our uh, officials on campus to talk about and make sure that our programs are accessible to all walks of life. So as to no surprise to any of us on, on this conference call this morning, um, agriculture ranks as one of the most hazardous industries worldwide, right? Not just, it's not just a United States problem, as we learned earlier, it's, it's also uh, to our friends in the North and, and worldwide. And, and this isn't new news to many of us. Um, it's, it's been a problem and it continues to grow as a problem and, and we do have a lot of work to do. Um, however, once when you look at some of the national data and the national statistics of ag related injuries, specifically on, on the US side of things, our surveillance methods uh, of ag related injuries and fatalities 
um, it's it's a struggle, right? Because that data, that data set doesn't include individuals that are self-employed farmers and ranchers, which make up most of North Dakota. Uh, we don't, I mean, we do have producers that they'll hire seasonal labor or they'll have a hired hand uh, or an H2A H2A program worker, but they don't have, they won't necessarily have a whole army of, of, of employees, you know, they might have one or two. And so that data really doesn't look at uh, those that are self-employed or just have one or two employees. And that data also doesn't include family members, right? Oftentimes farming is a family sport. Farming and ranching uh, is, is a family sport together. And so that data doesn't include uh, individuals on a family that have been hurt on a farm or a ranch or 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 have passed away due, due to a farm or ranch related incident. And again, kind of stemming back to my comment earlier, um, that, that current data we have here, it does not include any of our workers on a farm that, that have less than 11 employees. And basically what I'm trying to get at here is um, once you hit that threshold of over 11 or more employees, that's when OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, Administrative Rules, come into play when it in terms of reporting ag-related injuries. And so uh, the, the picture I'm trying to paint is that, you know, yes, we do have some surveillance method, methods out there, but they're not capturing a huge audience, especially within the Dakotas and uh, Northwest Minnesota and even, uh, even mo parts of Montana as well. And if you look in the literature, as, as many of you ha have due to your phenomenal work and, and where you're at with, with ag-related injuries, um, when you look within that literature, ag-related injuries tend to be lumped together, right? So if I want to look at, um, you know, what's going on specifically tractors only, you know, those types of injuries and fatalities or just machinery, right? Like balers or, or grain augers, uh, rock pickers, you know, very, very specific types of machinery. It's really challenging because the literature just lumps it all together. It's a farm related injury, you know, or, or tractors and machinery all lumped together as one. And all of us in this group, we know that they're separate injuries, right? There's the rollover, like the rollovers, rollovers of tractors, the 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 runover. You know, that's just tractors itself. We're not even we're not even having a conversation about the implements themselves either. And so, um, it's really tricky to try and understand through the literature specifically what's happening. And don't get me wrong, there there is literature out there that is starting to really separate those categories, but it's it's tough. It's that lumping together, this is everything that's happening. And so when we're looking at more methods to identify what's going on um, in, in our region, you know, specifically for my example, you know, North Dakota, Right now, the best the best resource we have include resources we have are media reports, right? So, uh, national news clipping services. So basically, what that's doing is anytime a farm related injury injury or fatality makes the news, there's a group or an organization that they search for keywords online farm accident injury uh, those types of keywords to help identify and find these news clippings online per se. And back in the day before we had the online, you know, this was all in print and newspapers. And so, you know, we're looking at media reports at, to try and get this, this collective bin of what's, what's going on in the world based upon what the news is reporting. Then there's also voluntary surveys, right? So, um, the opportunity to do a survey and find out what your state is is doing in terms of farm injuries. So really surveying your your farmers and ranchers or families um, on on what's going on in the world or it, not the world in within the state. And as you can see on your slide, this 
this publication, um, Farm Accidents in North Dakota, and, and right away, I hope you cringe just as bad as I did. You know, the word accident is on there. We've really, uh, we've moved away from an accident, right? So really looking at, it should be farm incidences in North Dakota. But nonetheless, I wanted to showcase this to everybody because the last time that North Dakota, specifically NDSU Extension, has really looked at what's going on in the world of farm and ranch related incidences was October of 1982. And I mean, I'm going to age myself a little bit, but I wasn't even alive yet. So uh, farming has definitely changed since the 1980s. Um, since, you know, since it, it, it's changing constantly, we're relying heavily on technology. And, and even earlier, we talked about how um, tractors and machinery have they've they've come a long ways and have gotten better in terms of their stability and and being able to operate on slopes and whatnot so the whole point of this is showcasing that surveys if not kept up they quickly become outdated and also i think many of us can agree that uh, garbage in garbage out meaning if you don't if you don't get quality responses you're going to get quality or un you're going to get information back that's that's not helpful to to your work and one of the challenges of getting surveys is just getting people to take them right and so there's definitely some challenges when it comes to just doing a a, a survey they're definitely a tool um, but but is it uh, the best way? And then finally, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So in, in, in the U.S., uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics keeps a running track of agriculture related injuries and fatalities. Uh, however, there's definitely limitations within each of these reporting systems. I hope you've been kind of thinking about well, Jeepers, Angie, this method's flawed. This method has flaws. And that's that's the whole purpose of me sharing them is because I want you to think about what are the limitations? Media reports, for example. What's the media there to do? They're there to, to collect and gain viewerships, right? They want you to watch their news channel at 6 o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night. They They want you to see headlines that capture your attention. So let me ask you this question. If someone passes away or, or dies from, from a farmer ranch related incident versus, or if someone um, receives a, a fractured or breaks a leg or a fractures their femur from, femur from a farm related incident, which, which incident's gonna make the news? It, it's going to be the fatality, right? Because um, that, that's what's going to capture attention. That's what's going to get people to click your news story or watch the six o'clock nightly news uh, versus someone who, who broke their leg and, and thankfully survived that, that incident. And so what I'm trying to get at is not all farm-related injuries make the news, right? And, and so there's an underrepresentation when looking at just relying on media reports. However, for some of, for some things, that, that is the best source we have. I already talked a little bit about the limitations of, of voluntary surveys. North Dakota itself and South Dakota don't participate in the national um, uh, survey of occupational injuries and illnesses. So we have no data, we have no state data from that perspective. And that's really disheartening that we don't participate, but we just don't have, we've been told we just don't have a big enough sample size. And that drives me crazy. Just because we have a, a low population doesn't mean farm injuries aren't happening here. And it doesn't mean that we're not just as important as other states. And then of course, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that limitation there is, those are all commercial related ag injuries or fatalities. And what I mean by commercial is that these are these are groups that have 11 or more employees. And so they collect that data from OSHA. And if you remember earlier, I talked about how our, our family farms and ranches, we typically don't meet that threshold of employees to qualify under under that OSHA regulation of reporting standards. So that means none of those individuals get included. There's no required reporting. Um, 
nothing nothing's of that nature so as you could imagine that's a huge limitation in the data set because it includes or it's not including a large population a large audience of our people um, within the state of north dakota so how can we do better i've kind of done the the doom and gloom, which I, I don't like going down that path, but it's really challenging to have a good understanding of what is happening locally here. And so I got so lucky and have been so blessed uh, when I started my master's project. Uh, one of my co-advisors uh, on my committee works very closely with some other research with Sanford Health. And, and like I mentioned earlier, Sanford is one of our biggest healthcare providers in the upper Midwest serving North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, especially Northwest Minnesota, and then parts of, uh, parts of Western, or excuse me, Eastern Montana as well. And so uh, I got the opportunity to sit down and, and have some conversations together and, and what we've done is, is gotten approval to look at our, the trauma registry data. And this data set is huge from 2010 to 2021, looking at four different trauma centers um, in North Dakota uh, and South Dakota and Northwest Minnesota. And so this data has been absolutely phenomenal because what it does is that it actually allows us to see and categorize what types of ag-related injuries and fatalities that have ended up in our trauma care units. And, and we also got the opportunity to look at AirMed data. And so AirMed is just kind of a fancy, uh, fancy term for um, our, our helicopter, so our, our life flight rescues, right? So if we need someone transported, uh, you know, all the way from Western North Dakota to our only level one trauma center in Fargo, North Dakota, there's no way they're gonna drive there. It takes six to seven hours. So they're gonna be airlifted. They're gonna have the helicopter ready to take that patient all the way over to Fargo. And so we got to see that data too uh, from 2019 to 2021. And we didn't, from that data, we didn't see any additional patients, however, the detailed descriptions of, of these incidences were just fantastic. It provided us with more information than we would than what we typically see um, in the nurse notes at, at one of our trauma centers. And I think it's really important. I need to back up a step. So uh, Fargo is has the Fargo Sanford Medical Center is the only level one trauma center for miles um, between Minneapolis, Seattle, Denver, and Omaha. And this is a really big deal for, for us in the upper Midwest because when, when you need life, we, basically for, for, for level one trauma, you unfortunately are knocking on death's doors if, if you need level one trauma care. This is specialized surgeries. This is immediate response teams, surgeon teams, and then the specialized equipment to be able to handle that type of injury. Um, so it, it's a really, it's really powerful data that we got the opportunity to scour through and look at because these are cases that are the absolute worst in terms of injury and, and even seeing some fatalities. So just wanted to kind of give you a, a, a glimpse of what type of data we're looking at and how powerful it's been in looking at what's actually happening, you know, in North Dakota and specifically the upper Midwest. And so, man, all of this data, well, now what? And so what I've got to do with our team is and and because I I love tractors I'm also I'm also a farmer as well uh, I raise beef cattle and sheep with my family and so tractors have been a huge part of my life and and they continue to be uh, you don't have a farmer ranch without a tractor and so uh, they're they're a big deal and so what I really wanted to do was what's going on with all of our tractor related injuries among pediatrics, so our, our kiddos, uh, and, and in the hospital world, our kiddos are, I think they label them, you know, under, 
under 25 years of age, um, and then also our adult patients as well. And what's really cool is that we can look at the incident, right? So how often is this occurring in the population? How severe they are? So how, how hurt uh, uh, and how intense these injuries have been? But then what's really cool is we get to see the outcomes, which is really unheard of in a lot of data. So when someone gets hurt, are they, how long are they in ICU? What's their total length of stay? Are they just discharged to a skilled nursing facility? Uh, we got to see that information and really look at how long the recovery road takes when it comes to uh, and when it comes to responding and healing from an agricultural related injury. And so from there, we then examine and categorized um, on the different types of tractor incidences, the injuries that took place, and then again, going through and looking at the patient outcomes, what, what happened after, after the hospital stay. And so now you're probably wondering, oh my gosh, you know, how did you break this down and break it apart? Because as you could imagine, between four, you know, uh, at least one level one trauma center and then three level two trauma centers, you know, we've got gobs and gobs of data. And you're right. Between all the trauma centers, that's over 40,000 patients that uh, this is this is just in general. I haven't broken down the ag-related injuries yet, but we're looking at a total of 40,000 patients between the four trauma centers. And then using key search words and, and going through cases, uh, we removed anything that did not include the word tractor. So as you can imagine, that helped us shore up uh, our number of tractor incidences quite a bit, leaving us with uh, 232 total tractor-related incidences. Now, we can't just stop there. Um, we did have to take out, so at this point, we're really searching and handpicking through and looking at which one specifically involved motor motor vehicle crashes because for us and and maybe many of you um our semis are are called tractor trailers so if there was a semi you know a semi truck semi trailer semi tractor trailer related incident we we took those out uh, because that is not the type of tractor that injury that we were looking for and then anything that was non-agricultural related in terms of tractor and you might be thinking what the heck does this look like well <laughs> you would be surprised uh how many parents step on their child's toy tractor late at night while walking through the room um and so those types of cases had to be pulled out they included the word tractor but obviously stepping on a toy tractor is is not a agricultural related injury uh at least the type that we were looking for so we took out any of those oddities that did not specifically uh go through an, an agricultural related you know, tractor purpose. Um, and then there was one that had to be transferred out to even a higher, um, if you can believe that, a higher level one trauma center. And basically that was looking at the burn unit. We don't, we don't have that capability in Fargo. And so they had to be, be transferred out. So the moral of the story is just kind of painting you this picture of how we got our final number of tractor related incidences down to 177 patients. Um, and, and so just breaking down that methodology of, of where we got that number. So now that we've got an idea of how many tractor, agricultural tractor related incidences there were, we started sorting it down and looking at what's the age trend and, and what's our gender trend. And, and as our presenters talked about earlier, you know, by far um, males definitely, which was no surprise, but we still need to take a look at what's going on. Uh, males made up 93 and a half percent of our, our patients. Uh, the average age uh, of, of these individuals was 58 years old and there were seven deaths. And so I got to take a second to step back a little bit. So um, there could have been, and, and that's a limitation I'll talk a little bit later on, 
Um, when it comes to deaths, these are individuals that arrived to the trauma center alive and then passed away um, and did not survive their injury while at the trauma center. So this data does not include individuals who had passed away uh, prior to arriving at the trauma center, if, if that makes sense. Um, and so of, of those seven deaths that did take place at one of the trauma centers, all of them were men, all of who were over the age of 65. So as you can see, um, I'm going to start painting you this picture and, and kind of showcase what what problems we're seeing up here in, the, in, in North Dakota. And so looking deeper into the data, um, hospitals, they rank, they, they provide an injury severity score or an ISS score. Um, and this category had the highest average, okay, highest average ISS score um, within uh within the system, within our data, and individuals over the age of 75 had an ISS score average of 13, which is very, very bad. This means, this score means that they have multiple body injuries that are very, very serious and require uh, trauma level care because of how severe they are. Um, and then just looking at our 65 and older age group, 85 tractor injuries occurred just within that category. And so um, we, we've definitely, again, painting this picture of, of where some of our, our problems and challenges lie. So now breaking it down a little bit more, what is the most common tractor-related injury uh, from our data? Because nationally, and even looking at the, the presentation prior to this, it was totally rollovers, right? So rolling, tipping over, and becoming crushed is, is nationally the biggest problem. But our specific regional data showcases that falls. Falls from tractors are one of our biggest challenges here um, that our that our trauma center data is showcasing. So there were of those 177 patients, 53 of them had fallen from tractors, um, blue blue rollovers out of the water. That's our next highest. Um, then kind of just breaking it down: struck by being propelled from the tractor, being run over, being pinned, and then and and looking at collisions. So this was really just a wow moment for, for our team because typically we we just look at what's the national trend, which which is which is rollovers. And so if we just look at national data, that doesn't help us do a good job focusing on prevention-based programs when really our problem is is falls from tractors. And now this is both injuries and fatalities at those those trauma centers. I just want to make sure that we understand this isn't just fatalities or just injuries. It's it's the combination of both uh, from patients from four of our trauma centers that we reviewed. So now even falling further down the rabbit hole, let's take a look at you know what was going on with these falls. And 33% of all tractor-related upper extremity fractures were due to falls. And, and that makes sense, right? Because as humans, when we are falling, we put our hands out in front of us to try and prevent and stop our face from being smushed into the ground. And so our upper extremities, our arms, uh, hands, wrists, uh, they're, they're taking the brunt of this. And 36% result in head injuries. Makes sense. We hit our head on the way down and once we hit the ground. And then also looking at uh, chest injuries as well. So those were the 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 types of, uh, you know, what was getting hurt during a fall situation. And the highest, it was the highest inju injury category like we had talked about. And again, our patients who were 65 and older made up the largest patient category within this group. So our, our individuals who are past retirement age, and there were five women that also um, experienced a fall from a tractor. Again, here we're at, here we are, kind of just painting that picture in the back of your mind. 
getting to this realization that we've, we've got a problem with our, our aging farmers, our older farmers are experiencing the highest incident of tractor related injuries. And so this is kind of breaking it down for those of you out there that really are, are number folks, um, just showcasing, we had 40 patients between the ages of 65 and 74 and 45 patients who were 75 and older. And the deaths all occurred uh, at our age bracket of those that were 65 and older. So as uh, as our folks and friends showed us earlier this morning, it's, it's our elderly population that's really experiencing a huge hit when it comes to farm-related injuries. And specifically for our what, what our data has shown, is it falls from tractors. And I just wanted to showcase uh, some of the uh, kind of our average age of the North Dakota farmer based on the National Agricultural Statistics Survey that's put out every 10 or so years. I think the most recent survey is going to be coming out this fall, I believe. Uh, otherwise, our most recent survey was done in 2017. But look at this trend. You know, in 1982, the average age of a North Dakota farmer was 47. Then in 2002, we jumped to 54. And in 2017, we're at 56.9. I really wanted to just say 57. Um, but I I really wonder, where are we going to be at that 60 mark when the next survey comes out? So the whole point of this slide is, is that this problem is not going away. It's actually... If, if this trend continues, this, this problem has the possibility to continue to grow. And so as, as farmers age, physical health tends to decline. And, and that's not just farmers. That's all of us. I hate to break it to our team here, but um, as we all age, things, things don't work like they used to. And that's, that, that's part of the aging process. We don't have to think about that in a negative light, we can really focus our energy on how do we how do we cope, how do we understand the aging process, and and how do we figure out um, helping families make sure that that individual can continue a healthy lifestyle on the farm or ranch. But nonetheless, as as we age, uh, mobility can become a challenge, and there's some research out there that's really looked at. Um, farmers who have mobility issues were twice as likely to be injured by a farm-related task. Twice. And that makes sense, right? If, if you're struggling to climb the steep steps of your 1964 International 1066 tractor, and I bring up that example because that is what I have on our farm, um, that, that is hard. The handles are hard to grip. There's only two whole whopping steps to step on, my goodness, and it's and it's war. It's slippery. And so if you have mobility issues or or arthritis and, and struggle gripping and climbing in the first place, it's it's a whole new ball game trying to get up into the cab of that tractor anymore. And so that's a really big challenge that we have to consider. Another thing that changes as we age is our vision and our hearing. Uh, how many of you in the audience know of farmers and ranchers that are that struggle with hearing, that have hearing loss, or are almost deaf because they grew up on an open cab tractor and and they uh, didn't wear hearing protection and were exposed to loud noise constantly um, in in an agriculture environment? And so when you can't hear, um, it, it, it can increase that probability of you getting run over or rolled over because you didn't hear something coming or didn't hear someone hollering at you to get out of the way or whatever that situation might be. And something else to think about, too, that has really just, oh, man, it's, it's, it's changed the way I think about things and look at things is the use of medications. You know, think about those individuals that um, have high blood pressure. So what type of medication are they going to be on? They're going to be on a blood thinner, folks. And so if you fall off that tractor and receive a puncture wound or a laceration, think about your odds of bleeding out. You're going to bleed out much, much faster 
than the average Joe because you're on a blood thinner medication. And so I think that really that that's something we got to talk about and and get help in terms of you know how how do we can we talk to physicians about this and ha- help them have a conversation about um your your ability and and the risks you know of of taking this medication when operating that machinery and then of course as we all age we all have re- reduced reaction times right the ability to hit the brakes quicker or or to be able to respond to something that we need to quickly respond to um and and that that changes over time as we age and so um what are so we we talked about people characteristics what about some tractor characteristics and this was brought up a little bit earlier in in this morning's presentation you know looking at what what types of tractors are producers using? And uh, it would be so cool to to see this data, but I, I don't even begin to fathom where you start, but it would be fun to see what types of tractors are these individuals falling from? Are they the older model tractors that don't have the rollover protective structure, that ROP structure? Um, because prior to 1966, they weren't required. Um, and even then, um, they weren't even an option. And, and preceding that, they also weren't a requirement to, to be placed on tractors. And so at that time, nobody wanted an added cost. ROPS meant added expense to the farmer. So you weren't, you weren't going to install that feature. So I'd be curious to know what types of tractors these individuals are driving. And then the model, were they open cab versus having a cab on it? And I talked a little bit earlier, but how are the steps designed? Man, some of the steps on those older tractors are horrible. I can't even correctly use three points of contact in climbing out of one of my tractors because it's just, it's too dangerous. It's so steep um, and, and just very limited on the number of steps and the handlebars not placed the best um, on that machine. And so having that conversation is key as well, understanding the tractor. And then how war is that machine? How war are those steps? Uh, the grips are gone on some of our tractors, uh, the little slip prevention grips, and, and then also removing how many of you may be guilty of removing a safety shield uh, from your machine to fix something and then never putting it back because it's fine. We don't need it to operate. It operates without it. And, and so once you remove that shield, then you have a challenge. So then what are some recommendations moving forward? And these are just ideas, folks. I don't want you to walk away with this as, well, Angie has all, all, the, all the answers because I don't. Um, I really think it, it's going to take a collaborative team effort of people to, to figure this out and put some programs together that, that help with fall prevention. But I think we got to start with the family. We need to start these conversations early. So in North Dakota, we have a program called Design Your Succession Plan. And what that does is it helps families sit down together and talk about the next successor of that operation, you know, who's responsible for what, uh, sweat equity, you know, those types of financial pieces, uh, the assets you own. It's really just getting people together to have a conversation instead of having that conversation once it's too late, once somebody passes away and then hard feelings begin. I think we can do the same type of model or concept with, with aging farmers is having that conversation, have it early, make it normalized so it doesn't feel so awkward and uncomfortable because my dad had to have that conversation with his dad when when he had to take away grandpa's tractor keys and uh, i mean my grandpa's been gone for many years now but that ended their their relationship their friendship it, it was horrible it was a horrible deal and i think we can do a better job helping empower families to better have those conversations how can we work with healthcare professionals? How do how can we learn and understand how physical abilities change as we age? Can we help people 
identify what to look for in their loved one in terms of when it's when we need to have that conversation and can we make adaptations or or accommodate farm equipment putting on lifts if we really if that individual is is still uh mentally and and capable of of operating that tractor but they just struggle climbing to get in and out can we install a lift? Can we still figure out ways to sa let them safely enter and exit that cab? And so with that, um, I am more than happy and excited to, to take on any questions you may have. This is my contact information. So if you're interested in learning more um, or wanting to collaborate, please feel free to, to reach out. And thank you so, so much for this awesome opportunity to, to speak with all of you today. It means a lot to me. Thanks, Angie. And again, I am, I just, I'm so impressed with your, your information and how you share it. And I think that is probably one of the key things I want to say. And I, and I do take notes as I, as I go and, and I, in my notes, I have that you're able to convey this information and share the data to a non-data geek. And I get it and I see it and I'm like, wow, like there's some really great things we can go, do with what you've learned. And it just, I think it just reinforces some of the things we know. You know, the other thought I had that I think you can probably say almost every single farm has a tractor and it's important for, this is important information for our organizations to support and educate about um, on farm health and safety. So um, there were a few questions in the chat. My chat has disappeared. I'm just going to read. Oh, there it is. I'm, uh, I closed it and opened it. So I'm going to go through th these th questions and then maybe I'll ask you a few more. Ron, we might run a little long on uh, the 1145 because Andrea has questions and uh, and uh, I just I think this is such great information so um Tammy said it is interesting to see this data similar to injuries related to the commercial vehicle sector and so it would be interesting maybe to do a compare there and maybe that can just enhance the data where we can draw parallels between other other areas if we can confirm that that's from the non-data geek who doesn't understand about how to do the research. So take that with a grain of salt. Um, it, this was likely from Shelley from CCR. I want to say CC raw, but uh, from the Canadian Center for Rural and Agricultural Health, they just changed their name, so I'm I'm sounding out the uh, the acronym. Do you search for, or did you search for words like combine, swather, sprayer, or seeder in the methodology? I'm worried that we're missing falls from other types of machinery. Yeah, great question. So I just want to, I just want to remind folks, this was specifically looking at tractors, tractors only, um, because that was our largest injury causation, injury type that that's what we were looking for just specifically so no we have combine like we have combine data we have auger data we've really separated it out and actually stay tuned uh because my my dissertation work is going to be looking at uh harvest related injuries which will, will which will include combines augers grain bins um so to answer your question, don't you worry, like we have not forgotten about that or have missed it. It's this was specifically looking at falls from tractors. So thank you for that question. Okay. And that, that came from Merle. She's, she's put a few more in the chat. She size would be important. So talking about size of tractor and she said, absolutely fabulous presentation. Again, I had no worries about you, Andy. And uh, yeah, you're, you got a cliffhanger here. So that's great. So I'll keep watching the chat for other questions. I think I covered them off there. Um, I'm just going to look at my notes here. Um, just with the comment, I found the common injury interesting especially around the mobility issues and i believe you met dina burnett when at the isash conference and just talking she has done lots of research at the university of saskatchewan she's now moved to pammy but her research was at the university of saskatoon saskatchewan um where she was looking at vibration 
And I think that could have, when you think about an older person and vibration and then getting out of a tractor and going down steps, um, that that could be a factor. And I don't know, like, I don't know if there's any way you could look at that, but I just think it's an interesting add on to that. Yeah, she had actually, I'm, I, I'm so, I'm, I'm happy for her, but I wish she was still because we had talked a lot at Ice Ash because their, her work was looking at, could we do before someone exits the tractor cab, could we do a simple concussion test to help get their vertigo, vertigo back in balance? Because think about sitting in a tractor or what or combine for hours and not moving, not moving at all. And all of that vibration that takes place, even though our equipment is a lot better when it comes to vibration, but it's still there, especially when you're sitting in it for eight plus hours at a crack and not taking time to, to get out and stretch. And so when you try to exit, your body is still in this limbo of trying to establish vertigo again. And she said her work is really looking at, is there a way if we have people do the simple concussion test, so you stick out your finger and you have, you know, you, you move it side to side and, and watch it with your eyeballs. If you do that before you exit the cab, could that help reduce uh, falling injuries. And I would love if there's some way for us to be able to keep looking at that. That's simple. That is such a simple um, step or a simple task that it guys are going to think that's a little silly, but that could save them from a life altering injury. And the folks at CCARHA and they this is available on the CASA site, but they've done work and they've they've put out in for information around that. So they do have resources that people can access from. It's on our website. They did it. It's on. I'm sure it's probably available on their website. I see Kendra has popped into the chat as well. Um, just to start that conversation and that piece again around education. So and I'm just seeing. Yeah, just saying, um, Kendra is saying, yes, it's important to bring awareness of the impact of vibration when operating equipment. Simple tasks and brakes can have a huge impact. So my last area that I was going to touch on is, is a little bit on the generational piece. And um, I'll, I'll put two questions in one. And Angie, you can share your thoughts on this. And, and so the first one, you talked about your grandfather and you know having to take the keys away and so in my notes i have attitudes of older older folks and it's a lot of i've always done this i can handle this you know why are you doing this and and i think when we think about our parents as they age or if you had grand grandparents simple as saying mom dad you shouldn't drive anymore like you know the time has come but it's bigger i think for a farmer because that is part of the fabric of who they are all their life they've been a farmer all their life they've done this. It's a lifestyle. So taking that away is a real blow to their identity. And I think that's an important piece. So that's part one. Part two, my question though, is the younger generation. And I think we can focus on educating the younger generation and having them learn and take good safety practices. But then they go home and there's dad and grandpa say, ah, you know, that's irrelevant. Like why? Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. It takes you longer. So when we have these attitudes of our older generation, how do we support the younger and how do we support that older generation? And, and this isn't unique to farming, but I think it's intensified in farming when you tell a farmer it's time to retire. So I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. <laughs> no, lots of, I mean, that 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 is the challenge. So I, I was asked to give this presentation at an extension disaster conference, right? Because Farm injuries are a they're a disaster. They're tra tra you know they're they're tragic in a community. It has rippling effects. And so when I brought up this concept that you just shared, you know, it's farming is a lifestyle. This isn't just an occupation. It, it's a feeling. It's 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 so deep, right? And how when I gave this presentation, you know, someone said, "How dare you, Angie?" You are, you're taking away someone's lifestyle, their livelihood. They don't know any different. And I said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to walk away from this thinking that we're going to take away a lifestyle or a livelihood. That That's not our point. We really need to figure out and have these conversations just because this is a scary topic. Nobody ever wants to tell someone you can't do anything, can't do this anymore. You can't drive your car or you can't drive your tractor we, we, we never want to take away that, that feeling of independence, but we do have to, we got to talk about this. And if we talk about it early enough, 
will that help allow that farmer to actually have some say and watch for signs? You know, I, I, to be honest with you, Andrea, I don't have a great answer because it is a, it's such a hot topic and, but, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it or figure out ways. How do we talk? How do we have our healthcare or that person's healthcare provider in that conversation? They really should be the ones that, you know, hey, this is a reality of X medication that you need to be on. If this, if if you continue this, here's here's the increased risks. And some people are going to say, I don't care. You know, that's that's how I choose. If if I die, that's how I want to go out. And that's a whole nother conversation. Um, but just I wanted to paint that picture of this is an ambiguous problem. And maybe there's people in this room that that want to help figure that out because that's what we need to do in North Dakota. We need to put together a prevention-based program that helps families. Maybe we identify different tasks that grandpa can now do on the farm and not take it away completely from him, but do something that, that he can adapt to based on his abilities. Let's match that task to the ability, just like we do with kids. Um, so, so that, I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's a big topic that I, I, I'd love help with and we need to continue that conversation. We can't just ignore it. I ask a lot of more philosophical, how do we move forward? <laughs> That's okay. Not, not distinct to. data questions, which uh, probably for a lot of folks, it's like, no, I need the data. I need the answer. And it's like, okay, but we got to keep thinking. But how do we progress down that? And I think as a community, we can start talking about that. And as you were responding, I wrote down succession planning. And we do a lot on farm succession planning, but I think it's around how do we transition the business? Right. Yep, it's just the How business. It's in grandpa yep. From, you know, doing doing things the way he's always done it. Yep. And may not be the safe way. And how does this family have that conversation? And I think we do have some of that in society. Like I say, my parents, um, they're probably more open to that. But what I wanted to say there is I think we have supports to have those difficult conversations in general life. My mom and dad who live, you know, in a, in an urban setting, it's much more easier probably to say, Hey, it's time to stop driving. This is the fabric of a, of a farmer's life. So how do we have that conversation? I think this community needs to talk about it. So Kendra said, yes, I agree. Need to start those conversations early. You know, and, you know, and by doing that early, we let those individuals be part of the conversation instead of being just the action of the conversation that someone else had for them. That's what I really like. How do we let them have a say and and have their voice heard and do it early enough in the game where you're not having to have those heartbreaking conversations or something bad has to happen until we finally do have that conversation. Grandpa ripped out the entire pasture fence line because he refused to look behind him when he was digging and cultivating. And, and so that was the final straw that dad had to take away the keys and man, if grandpa would have told us he was struggling, like his neck, he couldn't physically move. Maybe, maybe the relationship could have still continued before he passed away. You know, it's just, it's just disheartening to have to get to this point. So we're going to leave the presentation off there. I don't see any other comments in the chat, but I think your presentation does give us data. It gives us information we can work with, but I think it opens our minds to think about where we take it and what we can do and move beyond the simple the simple things and start talking about some of these bigger issues. I never have the solutions. I shouldn't say that. Sometimes I have solutions, but here now today, don't have the solution, but we can work on it. So that's Absolutely. what we can do. So Angie, I really appreciated your presentation. And I think those who are here, um, what I'm seeing, like super, super good comments. I appreciate your time and being here today. We are going to take just another quick break before our uh, AGM, which starts at 12 Central. I do hope people stay, particularly members. I know virtual AGMs can be difficult. There's a lot of uh, information. It seems pretty stale, but I will put a plea for quorum. You know, we need we need to hear. We'll get you the information. We'll move through it. It gives you a chance to ask questions 
questions about what's going on on CASA, what we did last year, and just go through that. So hopefully we can get you to stay for the AGM and move through that. And we should have you done probably, I would say, between uh, half past or 45 minutes past the hour. So just a little bit longer. And I uh, hope to see you back here at uh, 12 o'clock or top of the hour. Thanks, everyone. Okay, and just I, I saw a question in the chat. Uh, participants don't have their microphones <laughs> or cameras. Those have been turned off and muted. And so we will, uh, if you want to ask questions in the chat or using the Q&A, we'll do it that way. And uh, I'll just turn it over to Wendy because otherwise I tend to just run with things. So Wendy, the floor is yours. Not you, Andrea. Um, thank you. Um, and good morning and welcome to the CASA AGM. For those of you who have attended our virtual conference yesterday and this morning, I hope you enjoyed the speakers and the topics. I hear specifically the session on psychologically safe workplaces was absolutely outstanding, of course. Um, I'm Wendy Bennett. I'm the current vice chair of CASA. Unfortunately, Dan Trottier, the current chair, is unable to join us today. So I hope I can fill his shoes um, though I know that his size is much bigger than I, but that's that's what it is. So let's move along in our meeting. Do I need to call this to order? If I do, I am. Call to order. Sorry. Pay attention. Um, as mentioned, Dan was unable to join us. So in chair's absence, the vice chair can run the meeting of members and that's me. So now I'd like to call today's meeting to order. Thank you to the current board of directors. I've been privileged to serve alongside these passionate, hardworking folks who have over the years committed their volunteer time and service to the best interest of our stakeholders in the Canadian agriculture, health and safety family. Dan and I are coming to the end of our terms and it's been a privilege to serve on the CASA board. Carolyn Vanden Heuvel has advised the chair that she will be resigning from the CASA board. In her letter, Carolyn said, and I quote, I'm grateful for the opportunity to have worked alongside dedicated and passionate individuals like yourself and the rest of the board members. The relationships I have formed during my time with CASA have been invaluable and I will cherish them for years to come. At an upcoming board meeting and in accordance with CASA bylaws, the CASA board will appoint a member to serve the final year of Carolyn's board member term. These are the people in our organization that bring our dreams to reality. On behalf of the Board of Directors, I would like to thank our CEO, Andrea Lear, and the CASA staff for their incredibly hard work and dedication to the never-ending cause of bringing our Canadian agriculture family members home healthy and safe. So a little bit of housekeeping ahead of time. Um, welcome everyone ahead calling the meeting to order. I'd like to go over these housekeeping details. So the process we're going to follow, I will call for a mover and then a seconder. Only members can move or second or vote. So if you're not sure if you're a member, um, you, can, you have a little few seconds to do a little bit of research to find out. When moving or seconding a motion, please use the chat function. Then I will ask if there is any discussion. To ask a question or comment on a motion or AGM business, please use the chat function. Our translator is online, so you are free to chat in English or en français. Once discussion is complete, I will call the question and the poll function will be used to vote on a motion. So our first order of business today is to appoint a secretary for the meeting. Oh, you took away. The process will follow as I suggested, I will call for a mover and a seconder. If you are a member, please move or second in the chat. We will then open the item for discussion. When discussion is complete, we will activate the poll function, asking members in attendance and only members can vote to vote in favor or opposed. So the first motion is to appoint Megan Traxel as the secretary of the 2023 CASA AGM. Do I have a member to make that motion at this time. I can't see the chat, so I'm counting on you. Okay, Bruce James has made the motion. May I have a seconder, please? Shh. 
Shelly. Okay, so we have seconders. So um, is there any discussion? In five, four, three, two, one. All right, the poll is activated. Please vote. If you're in attendance, only members can vote. Please vote yay or nay in response. Oh, I can't vote. <laughs> I can't vote either, so you're going to be missing some members. <laughs> okay, well, I can't vote, but I can put my hand up. How about that? Um, so, Ron um, is aware. I'm not sure if we can change it, but uh, once we get the vote results, we can just put plus D and plus, well. <laughs> Plus me. I'll figure it out. If it's close, you, we'll get your votes. You can, okay. you can plus me if you want. But... He said All he's right. going to find the next one. So has the vote been completed? Awesome. Okay. So thank you. The yeas have it. Somebody voted note. Okay. Okay, so the person who voted no didn't mean to vote no. Good to know. Thanks for that. <laughs> All right, so thank you. So Megan is um, the secretary for the meeting. So next slide. This is our proposed agenda. A link to the agenda and other meeting documents was emailed to each member ahead of the AGM. The CASA team has also provided the link in the Zoom chat. So next two orders of business, approval of today's agenda and the 2022 minutes. The next motion to approve the October 17th, 2023 CASA AGM agenda as presented. I would ask for a mover and a seconder for this motion. Please use the chat again. Looking for somebody to move. Is that Kendra that's moving it? Kendra has moved. Kendra has moved. Can I have a seconder, please? Uh, uh, Exif Alberta has seconded. Thank you. Any discussion? Uh, Dean here. I can't move either. So you it's, going, it's going straight to uh, artisan audio visual. Just change your drop down your two and do to all. It won't let me. Okay. I click on it, it goes artisan audio visual. Dean, just say second if you're going to second. Se uh, second. So, Wendy, okay. Kendra, and uh, Exafe, be Alberta doing the, the motion. And any further discussion? All right, so we are going to activate the poll. Or do I have to do both? So as displayed on the screen to approve all in favor to approve the October 17th, 2023 AGM agenda as presented. If staff could advise when the poll has been completed. Ron, if you could end the poll. Mm -hmm. Oh, 10, 10 of 26 have voted. Uh, Ron, it's just we only have not all not all 26 are members, so not everybody will vote. So we'll give it about 30, 45 seconds and then display the results. I think that should be enough time. Perfect. Thank you. All right. And lastly, next up, approval of the October 5th, 2022 CASA AGM minutes. 
Again, I need a, a mover and a seconder to approve the October 17th, 2023 minutes of the annual general meeting. Sorry, 22 minutes. So Peter has moved. May I have a seconder, please? Kendra, second. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, can we put up the poll, please? All right, I think we can close the poll. Beautiful, thank you. So we have approved the October 5th, 2022 CASA AGM minutes. Thank you very much. Sorry, there we go. All right, so as I said, and I spoke with Dan actually in the last couple of days and he was very disappointed that he couldn't be here today. So he asked me to share his words with you. I will be brief. Um, I'm reading Dan's message. Hello, fellow colleagues and partners. Once again, I have the pleasure of sharing with you some of the highlights on behalf of the CASA Board of Directors regarding CASA activities in the last year. Our world is fast paced and full of change as we navigate the strategic plan that has been developed by the board over the last few years. As the board envisions the future of CASA within the agricultural sector, we think about how the organization will best serve Canadian farmers and producers in our dynamic industry. There are some key initiatives that we're posed to help with, including support to those that have been injured in the agricultural workplace, promoting health and safety standardization for agricultural operations, promoting awareness about health and safety at the farm gate through our industry partners, and working on sustainability targets for Canadian agriculture that will preserve our place on the world stage as a provider of food that actually cares for the people that produce the food. We will continue to grow our network and make inroads with health and safety organizations that have a vested interest in agriculture to ensure that we can remain the central hub for information. In November of 2022, CASA board members visited politicians and stakeholders in Ottawa, and in addition held many virtual sessions where we discussed discussed our plans for the future of CASA. The team was excited to find that for each meeting, there was a keen interest in knowing more about what we do and the vision we have for the organization. The success of that opportunity certainly points to the recognition that CASA is valued as a long-term partner, and we will continue to grow upon those relationships as we roll out the 2024 strategic plan and operations. On behalf of the board, I want to thank our sponsors, project partners, and volunteers that help deliver our programs to the agricultural community. Without your contributions, we would not be able to do what we do. I would also like to thank our CEO, Andrea Lear, and the entire CASA team for their hard work and dedication to the never ending cause of bringing our Canadian agriculture family members home healthy and safe. At the board level during 2022-23, we said farewell and thank you to Carl Klotzbach and Taya Green for the years of service and welcome Bruce James and Jonathan Jarrett to the Board of Directors. Together, the CASA Board includes representatives from across Canada from many different agricultural perspectives, and I thank each of you for your volunteer time, support, and commitment. It has been a pleasure to act as chair, and I'm keen to support the future of CASA in the coming years. Well, that was nice. Now, I would like to ask Andrea Lear, our CEO, to address you. Thanks, Wendy, and, and hello, everyone. You've seen me throughout the morning. I realized this morning I never really introduced myself. So hello, I'm Andrea, and uh, really happy to uh, lead the operational side and work with the board to bring forward the strategic vision of CASA. So looking back on the, the past year, and it's always weird, we're sitting here in October, but we're talking about a period of time that ended on March 31st. So it, it always feels like I've moved on when I reflect on these. But I would like to, to look a little bit at what we did this past year. And, you know, I'm very proud of the accomplishment, accomplishments that CASA achieved. And I think I, I, I do tend to look at outputs being results driven. And so we had some really great new resources to 
developed. I, I'm just sharing some. This is from the annual reports. Just some really great ideas came together. We uh, supported agricultural safety education with updates and translations of many of our online courses. We launched the Mental Health Hub, and thanks to FCC for supporting our Mental Health Hub. We continue to focus on primary programs, and these are the ones that people are very familiar with, Canadian Agricultural Safety Week, the Be Green Safe Program, Progressive Agricultural Safety Days, and the um, Canadian Agricultural Industry Injury Reportings. And then we do lots of just general outreach and awareness and work with partners and, and just make sure that health, agricultural health and safety is part of the conversation. Our funding agreement with uh, AFC Agriculture and Agri-Foods Canada ended on March 31st, and we are working on the next agreement and the funding and, and making sure that we can continue to provide services and support for agricultural health and safety. We do have seven areas that we want to focus on with the new funding application, and it's promoting health and safety to Canadian farm communities, national leadership on farm health and safety issues, agricultural health and safety, and sustainable agriculture, supporting the safety and health of rural children and youth, supporting on-farm agricultural health and safety, green safety, and that goes around prevention, education, and rescue training, and research and action, providing insight into agricultural health and safety. And so that's a lot of our research projects. I'm not sure if you noticed over the past two days, if you've been with us, some different looks on uh, some of our presentation material. One thing CASA did do, we updated our, our our branding, our look, our feel. We felt like it was time to make a change and refresh, especially with a new funding agreement. And what a great time to announce it, but during our conference in AGM. So I'm sharing with you our new look logo. And uh, so we really wanted to brace Canada. We are keeping aspects of the previous logo through our uh, lines representing fields, and uh, but also updated our color. We've added a tagline. And in English, it is sharing knowledge, protecting people. I'm afraid to say it in French. Bien, pour, I can do. The rest, I think I'd be a little scared and embarrassed myself. So, but I'm really excited for this. And I really think it sets up CASA for its next steps and represents where we're going. I also want to thank our, our sponsors and supporters. Without them, we can't exist. We need the sponsorship. We need the support from the government and uh, to do this good work. And we do do good work. I want to thank the CASA board. They are wonderful people to work with. I've really enjoyed getting to know everyone. I'm going to miss those that are leaving the board, but look forward to working with those new faces that are coming to the board. And I want to thank the CASA staff. You know, as much as I, I lead the staff side. I can't do anything without them. And we have some really great people. Uh, I noticed when we put the staff slide up, I, I snuck uh, uh, an update earlier today and I didn't update it in the slides. We are updating Robin's title to reflect the work that she does. And that title is moving from communications coordinator into director of programs and communications. Uh, she is part of almost everything you see come out of here. Megan Truxell is new to our team. She started with us in the spring and has just been fabulous to work with. And I really enjoy the perspective she brings. And I think just the support and the camaraderie that she's brought to the team. And we also have um, Christine. Christine, unfortunately, uh, had um, some personal matters and she's taking care of those. So she's been away on a leave of absence, but uh, we look forward to her return. And some of you might hear this random person, Tony, and Tony is just a fabulous person who's come in to support us during this year. And so they're just wonderful, wonderful people to work with. And I really appreciate them. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Wendy. Awesome. You're in charge of slides. There we go. Um, so I would actually like to invite CASA's treasurer, Dean Anderson, to review CASA's financial statements. Uh, I think everything's working. Picture, sound, everyone okay? We're good, Dean. Uh, we're good. Um, Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming to our meeting today. Um, we're going to try and keep this as short and as painless as possible. And luckily, our financial statements actually were in pretty good shape when we had them done with the auditor. Um, these will be the non-consolidated financial statements for the year ending in March uh, 31st of 2023. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll respond to them 
either as fast as Andrea brings them to my attention or at the end, we'll, we'll go back to those topics. So uh, moving to the next one, MNP is our auditors and uh, their statements are presented in a non-consolidated financial statements. Uh, they're non-consolidated because uh, CASA controls the Farm Safe Foundation and the financial statements have not been consolidated um, in the CASA. Oh, my chat is in front of my words. Uh, um, has not been consolidated in CASA's financial statements. You'll notice them in the notes. So um, next slide is there, in our opinion, and that opinion is actually of MNP. The company's financial statements presented fairly in all material res uh, in all material respects. The financial position of the organization as of March 31st, 2023, and the results of the operations and its cash flow for the year end in accordance with um, the Canadian accounting standards for not-for-profit organizations. So, um, First thing we're gonna look at is the statement for the financial position. Um, and uh, it's relatively simple and I don't want to uh, dwell on this too long. Um, under the assets, overall assets are largely unchanged uh, with no significance really in this report. You look at the bottom line, I think there might be about $5,000 difference between the two columns. Uh, the decrease in capital assets is largely due to the amortization of the grain, uh, B grain safe unit that we have. It is now fully amortized for anyone who wants to know that question. Um, and so the total assets actually decreased by something like about 5,000. So the next slide, um, Andrea is quick on the finger. Statement, of, so this is the liabilities. Um, CASA board is directed that the Canadian, um, when I look at this, the one main thing there, you look at the $28,000 under the CBA or the Canadian Emergency Business Loan. Um, we, of course, have a plan to pay that off before December of this year, um, but it stood as a uh, as a um, debt that we owed still. We had paid back some of the $40,000. Um, overall, uh, the liabilities, as you'll see here, have actually uh, in decreased slightly uh, by about 17000 <laughs> So this is the um, comments um, uh, under notes, commitment, sorry, under note seven. Um, if you look in there, um, there really has been very little change. The overall position um, is basically flat with a slight improvement. So there's about, what's that up to? About uh, $12,000 increase. It said relatively uneventful. Um, this one here, uh, looking at statement of operations, um, there's a couple points on here I'll just raise to your attention. I'm not going to focus on every single line. Um, CASA held its first in-person conference in 2022, so you'll see that number that says 2023, um, but the costs were in October of 2022. Um, confused the hell out of me. You said that earlier, Andrea. Um, anyway, we made a little bit of money. Um, as we look down, the next one down, um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, we actually ended up with um, a bit more of an increase in the funding there. And if I go down the list even further, uh, partnerships and sponsorships, we actually um, had a higher um, amount of money came in through our sponsors and their partnerships, also revenue. Um, if you look at uh, merchandise sales, um, basically their level, but just a point in there is that there's sort of an in and out um, in there, um, when we uh, get grant money for sponsoring some of the grain safety and especially the augers and the tubes, that actually gets offset later on in the books where we have a cost of sales. Um, overall, um, if you add these up under the statements, we had about a $219,000 increase in revenues. I'm going to the expense side of operations. Um, again, a couple notes in here. Um, the first one there that I've got is the amortization, which is a second line down. Um, we've now fully amortized it um, so that there's a cost that came off for that. Under the assistive grants, um, we actually had fewer grants. So the number actually showed was less expenses. Um, when you look down to um, consulting services, our costs increased. Um, we did some of our services in the past year 
um, using consulting services um, as opposed to increasing our staff um, so that we did have an increase in our, in our consulting services. And down at the bottom, travel um, distinctly did increase, but that's as we moved out of COVID. We moved from a year where we had very little travel to a year with more travel. Um, and bottom line, um, when you look at it, um, we're about $12,000 to the best side of a surplus. Um, so that was better off than we were at the end of uh, 2022. So going to the uh, statement of changes in net assets, um, uh, not a lot of changes on this. Overall, again, as I was saying, there's an increase there in that second line uh, for 2023, the third column over of $12,000. Um, so in, in reality, between the two years, there's actually very little change. Moving over to the statement for cash flows. Again, I don't have a lot here I want to focus on. Um, we had a decrease in working capital, mostly due to an increase in the receivables and the decrease in the payables. Uh, for example, less money was deposited and less money was spent in the year on a cash basis. Um, this was counteracted by an increase in prepaids and inventory. So if you look at the very bottom line there, you'll see there's about uh, $20,000 difference between the two, um, the two columns. Okay, confused myself with my own paperwork. You'll notice on this one here, the first row there is the SIBO loan, which we do have a plan for paying that off at the end of this year. Um, that that $20,000 is the amount that we will get if we pay it off. Um, so at this point in time, technically we owe that money, um, but we'll be getting that money freehold once we pay off the outstanding $28,000. Um, and if you look down the rest of the list and you go all the way down, um, cash resources end of the year uh, were about 19,000 to the positive. 12. Um, so in final, a comment from MNP um, in their recommendations to um, the board, uh, there were no significant matters to be addressed. Um, in the words that I often like to hear, it was referred to as a clean audit. Um, with no significant matters to be um, mitigated or changed or addressed. And I think um, we don't say this enough. Um, if anyone sees, yourself, sees themselves on this list, we'd like to thank you immensely for all of your donations and support over the last year and obviously previous years. Um, Without this money, um, it's very critical for us in matching our AAFC contribution. Um, and it does help us run several things that the AAFC doesn't necessarily um, sponsor directly in their funding. So thank you very much to our sponsors. Um, without you, we, we couldn't do what we do. And I'd like to make one point, if I can, Andrea, I'm going to break script. Dean's notorious for that. I'd also like to remind people that we have the Farm Safe Foundation and that we do take charitable donations. And if people want to, they can go online and oh, there's a link to it. Um, those, um, that money also helps us in our daily activities. So don't forget that if there's opportunity for charitable donations or your own organization allows us to make charitable, you to make charitable donations, and match them at some employers, um, there definitely is a tool to do that at CASA. Thank you. I'll go back on script, Andrea. Um, I'd like to move that the auditor's report as presented um, for the fiscal year of March 31st, 22 be accepted. Thank you, Dean. So I'm looking for a seconder for this motion to, to accept the auditor's report as presented. If you could please in the chat, if somebody wants to second that. I think you lost everybody, Dean. That's what happens. There we go. Niels, thank you, Niels. Is there any further discussion with regards to the audited financials? If you have any questions or comments, again, please use the chat function. Seeing none, um, we will activate the poll. If you would please vote yay or nay to accept the auditor's report as presented.
in 10, nine. All right, let's close the poll, please. Beautiful, thank you. So the audited financials have been accepted. Okay, Dean. I'd like to make a, a second motion. Actually, I guess it's motion five in the meeting. Um, and that is to appoint MNP LLP as our auditors for the 23-24 fiscal. Awesome. Thank you. Can I have a seconder for this motion, please? Everybody's getting really good at this chat thing, so let's give it another shot. <laughs> awesome. Peter seconds it. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I'm calling the question and activating the poll, please. Members, please vote on the motion to appoint MNP LLP as the auditors for the 2023-2024 fiscal year. The auditors report as presented for the fiscal year ending March 31st, 2024. Megan has provided a link to donate to the Farm Safe Foundation as well. So when you're done with your poll, you can click on that and sign over your next paycheck. That helps bring injured people back to work. All right, let's close the poll, please. Awesome. So MNP is officially appointed for next year. Thank you very, very much. Dean, thank you. Much appreciated. So next, Andrea, there we go. We're going to proceed to the election of the board positions up for renewal. This year we had four candidates uh, nominated for two board of directors positions. And a sincere thank you to all candidates for letting your name stand. And if you were not elected, I strongly encourage you to stay in contact, stay involved and um, Try again next year because we we have a continuous rotation to ensure that there's lots of fresh faces. And uh, some of us have been around a long time, but um, you know, every, people, there's a limit. So I would encourage you to move to, again, sorry. Um, so now I'd like to ask for a mover and a seconder to appoint Andrea Lear as election chair and scrutineer. So again, by the chat, if somebody could please make the motion. Dean is moving to appoint Andrea. May I have a seconder, please? Bruce James has seconded. Is there any discussion? No discussion. Can we activate the poll, please, to appoint Andrea Lear as election chair and scrutineer? All right, let's close the poll. And thank you, Andrea Lear is the election chair and scrutineer and I will hand it over to her. Thanks, Wendy, I'm just making sure I'm, I'm un unmuted. You can only do that once in a meeting, I think. So, um, so this year we held, oh, I'm missing something from my notes. Robin, can you quickly pop in my stats for the numbers into, into the chat? Sorry. Um, so we held our election through Election Buddy, and we've done that for quite a few years lately. And um, we had four candidates, Aaron Heimbecker, Colin Hornby, Shelley Karachuk, and Trevor Wally. And I'm just trying to see if I can get that data from Robin. She's probably scrambling to get it for me. Robin's looking. She's saying I'm looking. Sorry, I'm going to go to the team's chat. She put it in there. I'll start singing Wendy. I threatened Robin or Wendy was singing earlier. I'm sure we can get others to join you. What song do we want to sing? Should we do the Jeopardy song? I like the safety dance. <laughs> I was thinking about that earlier. I actually, when... Um, during her presentation, when Angie said uh, she was giving uh, 
information from 1982 and she explained she wasn't alive. And I was like, wow, I was probably jamming out to Duran Duran, but I thought Duran Duran, like it was a little early for Duran Duran. And so I went and looked what was, uh, what it was. And uh, it was safety dance was one of the most popular songs. Gloria, we could do Gloria. Uh, really? <laughs> Gloria. Da, da, da. Okay, there. Thank you, Robin. You saved them. 41% of membership voted. So that was 20 of 49 votes. And so those very exciting election results, if we have a drum roll for our new board members, Shelly Kirichuk and Trevor Wally have been elected to the CASA board. So welcome to the, them to the board. And thank you again for everybody for letting their names stand. So with a little bit of singing, and a little bit of uh, of dancing there while we tried to get the data. I'm going to turn it back over to Wendy. Awesome. Thank you. I'm not singing or dancing. Um, I would now, since you're all getting so good at this, I would ask for a mover and a seconder to accept the election results and destroy the ballots. So if somebody could make the motion to accept the election results and destroy the ballots... So moved by Neil, seconded by Dean and Kendra. If there's any discussion, questions in the chat, comments, lots of applause. All right, let's activate the poll, please. Members, please vote on the motion to accept the election results and destroy the ballots. And if we could close the poll, please, because everybody's becoming really good at that. So the, the yeas have it. So thank you for that. And thank you so much to the four candidates. It's exciting that four individuals were nominated for election, and I hope they'll continue to be involved with CASA. And welcome to Shelley and Trevor to the CASA Board of Directors. I'm particularly happy because I still get to know what's going on because Trevor works with me. All right. Now we're moving on to new business. Is there any new business from the floor? If you have a comment, um, please put it in the chat. Um, bylaws and resolutions and things like that cannot be voted on at this meeting. So if that's a comment, we'll need to bring it to the board um, separately, I imagine. Um, if there, is there any new business from the floor? Seeing none, I'm going to move on. So as we wrap up the 2023 virtual conference and AGM, CASA staff will begin planning for 2024. Actually, they've been planning for quite some time already. Once we know more about available funding and sponsorships and all those wonderful donations that everybody has been making to support CASA along over the years, CASA will be able to decide if the conference will be in person or virtual. So do stay tuned. Final words, I am truly honored um, to participate with this amazing group, not staff, not just staff, but the, the board of directors and the number of individuals, like-minded individuals that I have met across this great country and the passion that everybody brings to the table for protecting our farmers and protecting everything they do and the people that work with them is unparalleled. And I am forever grateful. I will miss this group tremendously. Um, and I hope to just really stay on top of what's going on with CASA and to, to support wherever I possibly can. So with that, I'm keeping it brief. I would now like to call for a motion to adjourn today's meeting. And I just need a mover. Who's Nobody the best? Because you all want to stay here. Dean Anderson moves. And I want to thank you, and we are adjourned. And that's the end of the meetings as well. So um, as you depart, thank you. I'm just going to stop my share. So thanks for everybody for participating in the AGM and the conference. And thank you, Wendy, for stepping in for Dan. I know he's grateful for that. Thanks, Andrea. So we're off. I feel like I'm saying bye, bye to a group, and it's only Wendy. <laughs> Have an excellent afternoon, everyone. Be safe. Thank you. Bye.